Welcome to uh, our study of um, the Bodhisattva Guide, which is His Holiness the Dalai Lama's teaching on the Bodhicharya Avatara, the way of the Bodhisattva. So, very glad that you could that you could join us here for this study, which I personally think is incredibly valuable. The way of the Bodhisattva really being one of the the great pith instructions of the Mahayana. So, um, as always, we're, we're um, engaging in this study, recognizing the suffering there is universally, and also understanding really the cause of this suffering, which is the delusion that we all suffer from, and which the Buddha in his enlightenment saw is not a, at all a given. This is not at all something that is basic to us, but it is something that is caused by ignorance. It's something that's been caused by inattention, mindlessness, unconsciousness. And it's something that can be remedied. So while it is something that's deeply ingrained in our habitual patterns, it is something that can be remedied by the path. So that's why we're here, the path being then us studying and understanding and essentially applying then the path in terms of meditation and also action in the way that we engage our vision in everyday life. So this particular is then what the way of the Bodhisattva is. It's really an instruction to um, expand our vision and essentially um, eliminate a condition of confusion and pave the way for us uncovering the innate natural disposition which is not obscured. So, um, so we looked at this last time and I wanted to go over a little section, just something that we covered last time, which is really something that highlights what it is we mean with, well, we could say the Buddha's view on reality and really uh, what it is that we need to understand in terms of what our challenge is. His only said something very profound, um, which he was expected to do. <laughs> but there was something that I thought we might just sort of sort of go over a little bit. And of course, what's basic to the entire uh, Buddhist teaching is what we call the view of interdependence. It's the understanding that Nothing really exists solidly the way we think it does, and rather everything is a web of just causes and conditions, and we are that, the phenomenal world is that. And our flaw, or our fault, or our error lies in fixating onto our projections. And there is a place then last time where His Holiness briefly discussed really what is what are the implications of this view of interdependence and he starts off saying the view of interdependence makes for a great openness of mind so that's where we should feel positively inspired this is essentially what this is about great openness of mind you could even say if people ask you what is what is buddhism all about well it is actually just that great openness of mind emphasis on great because it's something that goes beyond just our conventional sort of open-mindedness into really a substantial, great, inconceivable vision of the nature of reality that defies um, the ordinary confused um, way that we think of ourselves and think of the world. So, so His Holiness then said, in general, instead of realizing that what we experience arises from a complicated network of causes, we tend to attribute happiness or sadness, for example, to a single individual, to single individual sources. Now here we actually um, are looking at two things. We're looking at what it is that we're, that actually the nature of reality, and we're looking at where, what it is that holds us back from seeing that. And that's where Instead of realizing, and we could say the, the path really consists of two aspects. We always would say that. Um, in Tibetan, it's called Pantoki Yuntan, which means the qualities of elimination and the qualities of realization. And what we need to realize is 
that everything that we have arises from we use the word complicated here in the sense of complexity it's not like it's difficult to understand but it's more that we can't just make a single uh, you could say simple minded saying that's good that's bad and that's where our, that's really where our problem lies that we say that's good that's bad he's good she's bad you know etc so that's where we have this this failure and we should rather realize that we're talking about a complexity of just things are a number of things. We can look at ourselves. We're complex. <laughs> we can look at the people that we that were surrounded up, uh, so we know really well. And somebody would say, is that a good person or a bad person? We'll have to say, well, it's complex. People are not just, you know, simply good, simply bad. They're not in one way or another. We're all, we're all um, put together on the basis of a lot of different causes and conditions that we can call a network. We sometimes refer to it in Buddhism as a, a web or sometimes maya jala, we use the word, the sort of illusory web. But anyway, failing to see that, then what we do is, and this is where we go wrong, we attribute happiness, our, our sadness or whatever, to single things. And that's where we, we would go, I really want that, I really hate that. And we, um, we work continually in, within a scheme of likes and dislikes, wanting and fearing and so on. And that's where we actually go wrong. And this is, of course, where we, we're deeply entrenched in that habit. So in a way, we have a, a sort of some wonderful homework here, really, in terms of reflection. We can hear this, but you know we shouldn't just accept it because okay, the Buddha said so. We should actually, we should actually take this with us and see whether this applies. Now you could say His Holiness here. He actually, in terms of you could say Buddhist logic, he actually makes a proposition here. He, he comes up with what he just said, right? That we should try and have a look at this, and he makes and then he makes you could say he substantiates this then with reasoning, because he says if the referring to us and our tendency to attribute happiness or sadness to single individual sources. He says, but if this were so, as soon as we came into contact with what we consider to be good, we would automatically be happy. And conversely, in the case of bad things, invariably sad. And naively, we might think, well, I get that thing that I want. But then it's, first of all, it's not going to last. That thing that we want very often is, it's also made up of, you could say, a variety of causes and conditions. And even so, this happiness, is it really pure happiness or is it tainted with all sorts of other things? And so similarly also in case of negative experiences. So we can see it's, if we go through our life and try to have a look, these things that we think are gonna make us happy, do they really make us happy? And these things that we feared, are they really to be feared? Are they really bad? Is that person really so bad that we think? We should try and see if there's somebody in our life that we really dislike. And then we should say, are they 100% bad? In which case we should understand that this whole attitude that we have in terms of you know, re rejection or anger, and similarly, or if that's really justified, so good for us to go through that humbling exercise and similarly also the things that we're sort of like wow if only i could get this if only i could have that this maybe sounds only too obvious but at the same time it's these are tendencies that we are that we are incredibly addicted to so his owner says the causes of joy and sorrow would be easy to identify and target the if that were the case it would be all very simple and there would be good, good reason for our anger and attachment. So we can see we have anger and attachment, but are they really, are they really substantiated? Is this, if we've gone through the homework of analyzing here, then we can see that then there's a, there's a consequence, there's an absurd consequence if this were the case. So these two here, these two sort of little lines there, they actually constitute reasoning that we could apply. So then his wholeness, and this sort of leads into our application. He says, when on the other hand, we consider that everything we experience results from a complex interplay of causes and conditions, we find 
that there is no single there is no single thing to desire or resent and it's more difficult for the afflictions of attachment and anger to arise in this way the view of interdependence makes our minds more relaxed and open so this is just beautiful complete circle really of a proposition and the re the problem with that proposition the reasons why we should challenge the assumptions and what this actually leads to it's on the basis of us beginning to see that you know so and so is not an entirely bad person so and so is not entirely you know or such and such is not sort of incredibly desirable we understand the complexity this is where wisdom or prajna emerges of course there's a two ways to approach this prajna one is through this understanding the other is through also this you could say flexibility that arises in the mind through the practice of meditation so the this really is then something that we engage through the path and this is what we're engaging with this present study as we are now going to be looking at the various um the various points of the way of the bodhisattva this is going to be done really with an understanding of introducing a greater openness of mind this greater vision and that's where this understanding of what really we mean with interdependence um, that's where this becomes very very helpful and in fact this is again the, this is the core of what runs through the entire buddhist teaching in terms of understanding our reality that it's not solid it is what we call the unity of interdependence and emptiness this interdependence means that there's nothing that we can we can grasp as such and it's in the wake of insight that kind of insight that the ordinarily ordinary narrowness of mind is freed and it's there where the qualities of awakening possessing compassion strength and wisdom opens up so just sort of reiterating some of the material we covered last time then let's look at the text actually let's do what oh, uh, we'll do questions later at a later stage we'll actually do what his owners proposed last time which is just um begin the class with uh, sort of actually what i have done a little bit sort of go over and going over the the point of the whole teaching and then essentially developing um, taking refuge in developing bodhicitta so so um so we can do this sort of in the little bit sort of along the lines of a as we would do liturgy abandon evil doing practice virtue well subdue your mind this is the buddha's teaching like a star an optical illusion or a flame a magical illusion a dewdrop or a bubble like a dream a flash of lightning or a cloud so should one consider all compounded things in the jewels of the buddha dharma and sangha we take refuge until we attain enlightenment by the merit of practicing generosity and the like may we attain buddhahood for the benefit of beings in the jewels of the buddha dharma and sangha we take refuge until we attain enlightenment by the merit of practicing generosity and the like may we attain buddhahood for the benefit of beings in the jewels of the buddha dharma and sangha we take refuge until we attain enlightenment by the merit of practicing generosity and the like may we attain buddhahood for the benefit of beings so then the text itself let's see here so his holiness then taught this well he taught about the background of his of receiving the teaching the nature of what we're doing and the challenges in terms of understanding the um the mind that needs to be worked with and he then then goes on to say it would be helpful at this point to say something about the buddha's teaching in general according to the mahayana after attaining enlightenment the buddha turned the wheel of dharma setting forth his teachings in three stages first he taught the four noble truths on which the entire buddhist doctrine is based these are the truth of suffering the truth of the origin of suffering the truth of the cessation of suffering and the truth of the path now these are important because the first is discovering the the acknowledging humbly acknowledging our condition is not ideal there's something not working there is discomfort to say the least 
then we understand that this is not something that's given by some external power, nor is it just something that's inevitably the nature of our reality, but it's something that's caused. So it's something that can be worked with. And the third noble truth is then the cessation of suffering, which actually means that this condition can be brought to an end. This is a curable condition. And then there is the truth of the path, which is then the actual um, the place where we can proactively proceed then to be, we're empowered to proceed to do something about this condition. We can work with the cause and bring about the cessation of suffering. So that's the first, that's the first turning of the wheel that, um, that the Buddha taught, and it covers, let's say, this understanding of causation. With the second or middle turning, he gave the teaching on emptiness, or shunyata, and the profound and detailed aspects of the path, which make up the Prajnaparamita um, Sutras. So these are then the teachings that we have on wisdom and the paramita vehicle in general. Like when we talk, when we just were chanting the refuge, where we actually chant this, I think I mentioned this last time, there's a line that says, by the merit of practicing generosity and the like. And the like is actually the entire paramita vehicle. That is generosity, discipline, patience, energy, meditation, and prajna. And so that, really says by the merit of practicing the Mahayana path. So that's really the, the nature of the second turning of the wheel. And that is what leads to the uh, elimination of confusion altogether, which is then the insight into, complete insight into reality as it, as it exists. Um, you could say as it naturally exists. So then, then with the third turning of the wheel, he presented the teachings on emptiness in a more accessible fa fashion. So this is then, um, yeah, he says, in the sutras such as the Sutra of Buddha Nature, um, he spoke of an absolute nature that is devoid of the dualistic concept of subject and object. This is also the subject of the sublime continuum of what we call the Uttara, the Uttara Tantra uh, Shastra, the teachings on Buddha Nature. So with the third turning of the wheel, we, we then introduce this nature which is beyond any proposition whatsoever and that naturally possesses the qualities of the luminous, you could say abiding innate qualities of enlightenment. So, so um, His Holiness continues, the origin of suffering, namely negative emotions, may be understood with varying degrees of subtlety and this requires an understanding of the nature of phenomena. So as we see these, these three turnings, <coughs> they really are, they approach this situation of our confusion with, with increasing degrees of subtlety. So the first turning of the wheel is, is, um, is really understanding the causation, understanding where the suffering come from. The second is understanding how this, the, the nature of reality is not something that can be grasped. And the third turning of the wheel is even more subtle. It is this nature that cannot be grasped and which naturally um, possesses all the qualities of enlightenment. So His Holiness says, so we have these, we would say these teachings are then given to individuals of varying de degrees of, let's say, receptivity. His Holiness says, in the second turning of the wheel, the Buddha explained in detail the truth of the cessation of suffering. He showed that an increasingly subtle analysis of phenomena leads to a greater understanding of the negative emotions and finally to an even more refined insight into the nature of emptiness. So that's where understanding the nature of emotions, understanding how the dualistic mind creates these reactive patterns and how these are ingrained, we have then a way to understand and get a grip on what it is that really obscures us in terms of the gross, more gross and more subtle emotions. And then also an insight into really the, you could say, the cognitive obscuration that assumes an existing reality when in fact there is no reality. And that's where he speaks about a refined insight to the nature of emptiness. 
So His Holiness says, this in turn leads to a more profound understanding of the truth of the path. So that is on the basis of that insight or view, we then know what it is we need to undertake in terms of the path. In the ter third turning, we find a detailed explanation of the path for attaining enlightenment. It emphasizes the potential that we all have for future enlightenment. This potential called Tathagata Gaba or Buddha nature is something we have always had from time without beginning. So this is where we introduce this, this very subtle nature that abides unobscured. And this is this nature that is never corrupted. We say it's never corrupted or tainted in the condi condition of confusion. It remains as the ground that is what we call primordially pure. And this nature is um, in that it's never changing. It's also not improved when there's enlightenment. So it is, like it says in the Uttara Tantra Shastra, it is like something that's hidden. We sometimes give the image of treasure that's hidden under a poor man's hovel or a statue within a mold. So we have a statue within a mold. And the thing is, when we remove the mold, nothing has been added or improved. Uh, in this statue but all of a sudden we see it similarly also this treasure that's buried under a poor person's um, um, where they live um, it's something that is 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 there yet not knowing that it's there not having access to it there is this great suffering of poverty so this is something that we have always had his own sense when we talk about the truth of the path we're not talking about something completely foreign to our nature, which might suddenly appear like a mushroom, as though without a seed or cause. It's because we have this foundation or capacity for ultimate omniscience that we're able to attain enlightenment. So we're never introducing something new with the practice of the path. We're unveiling what was all, always there. But it's also on the basis of having that disposition. And this is what Chikam in the uh, in the Shambhala teachings refers to as basic goodness. Um, it's because we've always had that, that also when we hear the Dharma and we, we in general encounter things that are true, this actually, we resonate with that. When we encounter selfless action, this 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 feels we we feel good around selfless persons we feel good ourselves when we act selflessly and when we encounter someone that that has genuine authentic freedom and realization this also feels right this is why we we connect with persons with great teachers like Kyabje Dilgu Kansarumbaji Kyabje Sonsa Kenza Rinpoche, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, Chikyam Trungpa Rinpoche, His Holiness Saka Trinsen, and so on. We meet great people. And it's not just that they, they're sort of interesting and exotic. We don't really just relate to them as sort of interesting creatures. But there's a sense of something genuine, authentic, real. And that's where the, the uh, you could say, because we have this abiding in it, this position, this is something that resonates. So His Holiness continues, the texts belong to the second the texts belonging to the second turning demonstrate the empty nature of phenomena, while the Sutra Buddha nature and also Uttara Tantra Shastra and other teachings relating to the third turning emphasize wisdom, the clear and luminous aspect of the mind. So you could say the second turning of the wheel, this establishes the objective nature of everything, and the third turning of the wheel establishes this subject that understands this of course we in the in the subject that understands then we understand that this subject that presently abides by the sort of the insecurity of duality positing self and other and so on this ultimately is free from that but it's only on the basis of freeing ourselves from that confusion of duality that we then discover the actual nature of phenomena, you could say the objective nature of reality. So we would say that these two turnings of the wheel, um, they both, the, the second and the third, they constitute what we would call the definitive teaching. So um, 
the Buddha taught the Four Noble Truths first as the foundation of his whole doctrine. As he elaborated his teaching, he adapted his words to suit different needs and mental capacities. The ways he taught varied considerably, and what he said was more or less was more or less profound. <laughs> <laughs> this, this doesn't mean that what the Buddha said was kind of slightly okay, but it just means that it was adapted to the varying capacities in which, like we just discussed, some of the teachings were very profound, some were more easy to grasp. So depending on those he was addressing, so according, you could say compassionately, skillfully, the Buddha didn't just teach the same thing to everybody, but was very much sensitive to those he was addressing. It is important, therefore, to know with which teachings express the ultimate sense, which have been adapted to the particular capacities of his disciples. Um, so, so that we, we could say that we have what is known as the provisional teachings, and then there are the definitive teachings. Provisional teachings, they are teachings that are given, really taken into consideration, the relative situation of those of the the um, of, of those that are on the path, whereas the the definitive teaching is simply just stating reality as it is. Nicholas continues: If on analysis we find that the Buddha's words, taken literally, appear illogical or lead to contradictions, we should understand that such teachings are a relative expression of the truth necessarily adapted to the to the comprehension of particular beings. So for example, we we very often find in the Buddhist teachings um, things that really just have to do with the particular situation such as um, you know particular of those to whom the persons at a particular within the modern world, world very differently for example when we would say when we have the the teachings that have to do with the phenomenal world that really is what we call particular that are, that are particularly for example to the to the situation in india uh, where the buddha was teaching but when it comes to let's say for example the prajnaparamita teachings the teachings on what we just looked at the teachings on interdependence that has that is has nothing to do with with india or uh, you know this is you could say the the actual presenting the actual nature of reality so that's where we then have the teachings on emptiness and so forth so his only says on the other hand if his words can be taken literally and are without any contradictions or flaws we can accept these teachings as expressing the ultimate truth so this is, you could say on one hand, the provisional teachings are the teachings that operate with notions of cause and effect in particular realities for people in various contexts. And the definitive teachings, which are then what expresses the actual nature of reality. So then His Holiness says, faith is very important in Buddhism, but wisdom is even more so. True faith has to be based on reasoning. Simply to say, I take refuge or I am devoted blindly and without reflection is of no value. And that's where we might, we might very often in the modern situation of Buddhism, then very often there's this kind of lazy attitude that, you know, I really like this teaching and I'm just going to go along with it. And, and uh, it sounds very nice. The lamas are lovely and, you know, I, I like the Buddha's teaching and it feels right. And it, sort of ticks all the boxes and then we sort of just go in you know and yeah yeah the the teacher is great and that kind of simple-minded that kind of simple-minded uh, approach which of course um could is is not bad but on the other hand it doesn't really um it doesn't really engender deep faith it's simple-minded faith and that's where if we are critical about the teaching we reflect on them and actually question them and the his uh, and the buddha he, in one in one uh, sutra he to this i think the sutta of the kalama people he's asked should we 
he actually says to some people asking, who do we trust among all these many different teachers? And the Buddha says, with regards to my teaching, you should never accept it out of respect or faith in my person, but on the basis of inquiry. Just like if you were to investigate gold, just like a merchant who prior to purchasing some gold, analyzes, checks, verifies, melts, hammers, <laughs> weighs the gold before purchasing it, then similarly also before we engage in the teaching and you could say develop faith in the teaching, we first see is it worthy of our faith, is it worthy of our trust? And once we've actually properly analyzed the teaching, then it is that we begin to see the validity of it. Then we have a very deep faith. Then it's no longer this sort of simple-minded or blind faith. It's a very deeply rooted trust, confidence kind of faith. So His Holiness says, without rational investigation, it is impossible to distinguish whether the Buddha was speaking in an adaptive or relative sense, or whether his words are to be taken literally as expressed as expressing the ultimate meaning. And that's where we, we need to then, on the basis of analysis, we need to understand the difference in the Buddhist teachings, whether we're talking provisional sense or definitive sense. So that's where we, we also have um, this references to the four reliances. His Holiness says, this is why the sutras mention the four reliances. And that's where, and we find this in the, in the, um, in all the sutras, or both in the Mahayana and the Pali Canon sutras, do not rely on individuals, rely on the teachings. Do not rely on the words, rely on the meaning. Do not rely on the adapted meaning, rely on the ultimate meaning. Do not rely on intellectual knowledge, rely on wisdom. So just very briefly, this means we should, we, it's not enough just to think that, oh, the teacher's lovely. <laughs> We need to listen what's being said in class, and that's why we're there. This is what is what we take with us. So we're not about just being blind followers. This is about assessing the value of the teaching, not objectifying the value of the teaching in terms of somebody who's very charismatic or whatever. This is about us seeing yes, there's there's a charismatic teacher on the basis of having you could say. Taking, taking the medicine, the person is healthy, sane, reliable, has all these qualities, but that's on the basis of practicing the teachings. So this is what we're doing. So that's where then do not rely on the words, rely on the meaning. So we might come across, for example, us in the modern world approaching Buddhism, we might be annoyed with the archaic, um, archaic formulation of classical teachings and also references to cultural practices that don't apply within our, in our uh, world. And that's where we need to sort of get beyond that and actually just see what is the message here. And that's where, when it comes to the message, we shouldn't just talk about the, the adapted meaning, which is, you could say, adapted according to the particular audience, but really understand then what is the ultimate objective of the teaching. And again, this is also really important. Do not rely on intellectual knowledge, you could say the rationality, but wisdom, which goes beyond rationality. So in the ultimate sense of the, the, the um, teaching, the teaching is actually just something that points beyond the words and to actual experience. So His Holiness continues here, he says, in contrast to ordinary intellectual understanding, the true nature of the mind is clear and knowing and has never been veiled by obscurations. So this is not just an, an you could say, an, an intellectual proposition, but this really is the nature of what the Buddhist path intends, which is not to be philosophy, where we just learn things, but it is really to um, introduce us to something that is beyond just ordinary thought and the ordinary habitual narrow scope of, of the confused mind. And that's where the purpose of the teaching is really to take us beyond the words and to actually to introduce us to a greater reality. And that is then um, where we um, 
where we speak about the ultimate nature of the mind as being clear and knowing and not being confused. And that's not something about subscribing to a particular dogma or a particular doctrine. This is about actual experience and realization. So His Holiness say the, the practice of the Mahayana is entirely based on this understanding. So when we practice the Mahayana, we do so with an understanding that what we are what we're about is something much more than the words. In Tibet, all the teachings of the Buddha from the Four Noble Truths up to the highest Yoga Tantras have been preserved and are practiced in the following traditional order. The first stage, this is what we call then the tenets. These are sort of the gradual path. And this is very much an essential part of the Indo-Tibetan uh, Buddhist approach. We find a slightly different approach in in the Zen or in Chan Buddhism, where we don't so much op operate with the notion of a gradual approach, but more in terms of a, a, an instant approach or a approach into that sort of an insight that takes us into an ultimate understanding right away. But that is generally seen as being um, uh, not the scope of ordinary persons. It's definitely a valid part, but it is tricky and it is regarded as uh, a scope for those on the, on the uh, you could say who have for those who have few obscurations so within indo-tibetan buddhism in general then we operate with this notion of tenet system gradual path and gradual you could say and gradually increased um, perspective in terms of the teachings so his holiness says then from the four noble truths up to the highest yoga tantras which has have been preserved in tibet um, they follow this, this traditional order. The first stage is the Shravakayana, or fundamental vehicle, the path of the Four Noble Truths, beginning with the Vinaya, which is the monastic dis discipline, which teachings, teaches the training of discipline. One progresses through the 37 practices leading to enlightenment, thereby developing the two trainings of concentration and wisdom. So we talk about three trainings. One has to do with, with the Vinaya and the particular trainings of the Vinaya, which is not just actually monastic, but also lifestyle in general. This also includes the lifestyle of the, of the lay persons. And then also the 37 practices, which are uh, some uh, various sets really of, of the path, such as the four mindfulnesses, the four things to be abandoned, the Noble Eightfold Path, and so forth. Um, and these, that then constitutes what we would say the first training, which is the training in uh, ethical or behavior, um, the framework for the teachings, and then they, they become the foundations really for the two trainings of meditation and wisdom. So we talk about these three trainings in terms of um, uh, the behavior or ethical, the ethics, what we call shila, discipline, and then meditation, samadhi, and then um, and then wisdom, prajna. So His Holiness says these three trainings are the basis for the two other vehicles. The second stage is the Mahayana or great vehicle and consists of the practice of the six paramitas. Generosity, discipline, patience, endeavor, meditative concentration, and wisdom. The third stage is the Vajrayana vehicle of the secret mantras, which sets out the extraordinary means for realizing profound concentration through the union of mental calm and clear insight, and for the progression through the four tantra classes, Kriya, Upa, Yoga, and Anuttara. So the first, the first, what we call the the Shravakayana, um, this corresponds very much to the way that Chugim Trungpa Rinpoche explains the three yana system, and it also corresponds to what generally is referred to as the three levels of vows, namely the Pratimoksha, the Bodhisattva, and then the Vijadhara vehicles. So that's where the Mahayana, the great vehicle, is then the practice of the six paramitas, like I was pointing out when we <laughs> take the refuge, it's like with the practice of generosity and so on. And then the Vajrayana is then the 
practice of bringing Buddha nature, the bringing the insight into this luminous nature onto the path. And we do this on the basis of the meditation that recognizes this, this abiding innate co-emergent clarity and, and engages this through the practices uh, of essentially integrating this vision as already spontaneously present. And that is the practice of Tantra. And this is then approach in increasingly um, profound ways through the tantras that we refer to as Kriya, Kriya Yoga Tantra, Upa Yoga Tantra, Yoga Tantra, and then Anuttara Yoga Tantra. So His Holiness says, Buddhism has flourished for centuries in many countries, but it was in Tibet that all three paths, the Shravakayana, the Mahayana, and the Vajrayana were preserved completely. It is in fact possible to go through all these stages of practice in the course of a single session. And this also is something that's reflected in, in those of us who, who practice, let's say, Vajrayana, the taking refuge, we could say, constitutes the Stravakayana, the developing the Vaya Bodhicitta is the Mahayana, and then the actual sadhana practice is Vajrayana. Um, his Holiness then says, moreover, Tibetan scholars never ignored the practice aspect and experience practitioners did not neglect to study. This seems to me a very good way of doing things. So this is important. We talk about, sometimes we talk about the, the crazy intellectual and the dull meditator. And that's the dangers that the Tibetans were very aware of. And so that's where scholars, those who um, are knowledgeable about the Buddhist teachings would never ignore practice. And also the experienced practitioners did not neglect to study. Those who are um, great practitioners are remarkably. Um, if we, for example, read the songs of Milarepa, Milarepa is the quintessential yogi, right? But if you read his songs, they are just full of references to, to the actual, the, the classic structure of the Buddhist teaching. So to understand Milarepa's teachings, we need to actually uh, have a good basis in the theoretical aspect of the teaching. So there's always this, this unity really of having a clear understanding that needs to serve as the foundation for the actual practice of the path. And so His Holiness says in his sort of understated way, this seems to me to be a very good way of doing things. <laughs> so, in the course of time, different lineages appeared within this complete tradition influenced by extraordinary masters who at different times and in different places express the teaching in slightly different ways. We therefore have the ancient tradition of the Nyingma and the newer traditions of what we call the Sama, namely the Kadam, Sakya uh, and uh, Kaju traditions. The present Gilug tradition uh, evolved from the Kadam lineage. Despite the differences between these lineages, they all incorporate the Buddha's teachings in full, combining the practices of the Sutrayana and the Mahayana. I must say, I would wonder here whether His Holiness actually doesn't mean to say the Sutrayana and Mantrayana, because that really is what is the hallmark of Tibetan teaching, of Tibetan Buddhism, really the these two approaches, you can say the rationality of the sutra teachings and then the deep, uh, you could say, insight that is basic to the mantra teachings. Anyway, the burn tradition, which has existed in Tibet before the arrival of Buddhism, also came to possess a complete set of the Buddha's teachings. So we, we, uh, we come across the burn teaching, uh, which in fact is in complete agreement with really with the the um, Buddhist teaching. Um, I remember once doing a circumambulation of Mount Kailash, and on the when you go around Mount Kailash, then you you circumambulated as a Buddhist, you circumambulated clockwise, right? When you're a Bonpo, you circumambulated anti-clockwise, which is really interesting because then, as a Buddhist, you see all the Bonpos as they come come to you. So it's a great way of meeting, actually. The Bhampos see the Buddhists and the Buddhists get to meet the, the Bhampos. But I actually stopped one young 
one young Lama there and asked if he would summarize the, the difference between the two. And he actually just says there is no difference whatsoever. They both operate with the same view of dependent arising and in terms of also the way that this is practiced. So, of course, we talk about different aspects of burn tradition and some do include this shamanistic um, shamanistic practices, but uh, as a whole, really, the burnt tradition nowadays is considered one of the, um, the yeah is considered on par with the the uh, the Buddhist traditions. And His, His Holiness the Dalai Lama himself is actually uh, also sort of honorary head of the burnt tradition. Okay. Um, <coughs> Let's see here. Um, the live studio audience had a question early on. Uh, so it's to do with you know, desire and not desiring things. If I desire to make a garden, mm -hmm. um, I uh, and I can see at the end result I'll have vegetables and this yeah. and the other. I need that desire and that thought to carry through the project. First, I have to dig, then I have to start. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so desire is necessary. Yes, yes. Um, so it sort of seems, it's sort of like to me, it seems a bit nebulous, like, you know, no desire, no. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, yeah. Not wanting for, for anything to be momentum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So the the question is really when we when we talk about the the, the flaw with attachment and uh, aversion, isn't it attachment or desire? Isn't that something that's you could say constructed? If we, for example, want to uh, create a garden, then there has to be that vision of desiring the outcome of the garden. So can't desire be something uh, a good thing? And definitely, but we also know that when we're when we're desiring a garden, then also it comes with a lot of um, a lot of. It's a mixed bag. If we if we engage in that project, we know it's going to be fraught with all sorts of challenges in terms of the logistics of it and all the sort of challenges, expenses, headaches, the tradies, the the, <laughs> the people who don't show up on time, and the over, cost overruns. And and once we have the garden, then we have to sort of go through all the. The sort of the, uh, the you know the animals that come in and eat all the vegetables and the bugs and uh, etc and also you know all the animals that are going to be killed in the process of making a garden the insects and so on so it's all we understand that yes it is definitely desirable for us to have a garden but at the same time also it's it's not just good and just a 100 good thing it is something that comes with a vast complex web of all sorts of things so that's why we understand dependent arising is or rather we we understand that there is no such a thing as just we think garden good no it's a mixed bag of so many different things so that's where we understand the complexity of it yeah so that's where it's very helpful to to understand it's not as if there is good and bad but we understand that there's it's really just a complex web of all sorts of causes and conditions that bring all sorts of results which are also good and bad yeah so of course and we will also say it's also wisdom that enables us it's an understanding of uh, causes and conditions that enable us to understand what is it that's helpful so that's where the the understanding of um, dependent arising it's what leads us to do which what is really um, what's constructed so that's so in general just um so, so sort of it's really juxtaposing it's enabling us to really have a clear vision of there's no such a thing as just good and bad but it's really a mix of many different causes and conditions and that's that helps us a lot with our reactive patterns for example if let's say the tradies don't show up on time we know that it's a good thing if they were to come but then again, they might not <laughs> they might not show up, or there might be different things. It doesn't mean that they are bad people either. It might be that they, one of them just uh, you know somebody just had a punctured tire, or you know there was sort of somebody had a baby, or all sorts of things. So so that's where we understand a greater complexity of things. Anyway, this is 
this sort of the the statement on um, dependent arising is something I think that we can just take as a homework and just reflect on it because it's something that uh, is is something we can verify on the basis of our own experience. So let's see here the questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And good morning. <laughs> uh, but to rely on the teaching is to rely on a on person and persons. We have to rely on the Buddha and those who heard him and wrote down his teachings or what he means. Don't rely on me either. Try for yourself and see. Well, exactly. And that's where that's where um, uh, when, when it comes to the Buddha's teachings, then we don't actually we 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 appreciate the buddha but it's only on the basis of his teaching actually so if the buddha said something that we wouldn't find valid we would we would reject that there's an interesting place where his holiness the dalai lama also says you know if 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 um, if science finds something that they can prove disprove the buddha's teachings then he's all for so so um, so we definitely rely it's really about relying on what the Buddha said. And it's not about looking at uh, the Buddha, but looking at what the Buddha is pointing to, the famous image of the Buddha pointing to the moon. Then don't look at the finger, but look at the moon. Um, then he says, when he said, Bernpo in Buddhist, there is no difference as in the view. Are the, difference, are the differences then in the methods? Slightly different, but again, in principle, the same. Bit unrelated, but could you recommend the translation of the hundred thousand songs of Milarepa? Well, it so happens that I can. Now, I'd say the the translation that we had for many years of Gama C. C. Chang was excellent, and we are so many who have appreciated it. But just recently, there was somebody who sadly passed away called Christopher Stagg, is a student of of um, or Christian Stagg, I can't remember, who is a student of Ponla Brimbaje, who um, who uh, did a translation which uh, I've actually just ordered it myself. But um, this is th this um, I, th I suspect this is because there were there were many imperfections in in the Kama Chang's translation and this uh, new translation by by Mr. Stagg I think will be um, much more authoritative. Yeah. Um, and yes. Regarding the desire to start something, I read many times a Buddhist passage saying something along the lines, it's best never to start something, but if you have to, you must complete it in full. Well, that's sort of more the, the practice of the path, you know. Trungpa Rinpoche is very much like that, you know. He, was, he would say, you know, with the teachings, you know, well, do you really have to do it? Okay, but if you do it, then you better complete it, you know. Um, does this have anything to do with desire and mundane doing? Well, yes, there is this sort of, this is not just Buddhist, this is sort of just universal wisdom, really, but you, you come across it a lot in Asian context, which is more sort of secular wisdom that tells you it's good when you start something to complete it. Otherwise, we end up having this pattern of, you know, not having completed projects, yeah? Sometimes we even get definitive truth from someone we don't respect otherwise. That's right. Yeah, yeah, that's true. The definitive truth and truth in general, we could, again, not relying on the person, but looking at what they're saying, we could very often um, receive truths from from, a, from a unexpected quarters. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> such a great session. First time in six years that I've understood the difference between Hinayana, Mahayana, Vajrayana. Thank you. And of course, thank you to His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Uh, name and author of book again, please. Um, if you're thinking about what we're presently studying, I'll just bring it up here. Um, we look, we're looking at a commentary on the way of the Bodhisattva, which presently is published as the Bodhisattva Guide. Now, this was previously pu published um, in a book called a Flash, a flash of lightning in the dark of the night. 
And then it went through another rebirth, which was called For the Benefit of All Beings, I think. But the, the present work we're studying is then called the Bodhisattva Guide. And I was also referring to, to uh, Christopher Stagg, or Christian Stagg's translation, which is called The, the 100,000 Songs of Milarepa, like the, um, like the previous one. Um, is if burn is the same as Buddhism, then what was the need for all the effort to instate Buddhism in Tibet? Um, burn adapted to Buddhism. So, so it wasn't initially uh, like Buddhism, but uh, Christopher, thank you, Christopher Stagg. Um, yeah, uh, Byrne initially was very much, um, if you could say, emphasized the shamanistic aspects and didn't really constitute a path to enlightenment, even though we do say that the Byrne tradition had Tsokchen teachings. Um, then the, um, the overall culture in Tibet um, was um, very different from what the Buddhist teaching brought brought to Tibet. And you could say essentially there was just sort of a, a unification of the two. But initially there was some some there was strong reactions against Buddhism from burn quarters when uh, Buddhism came to Tibet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Christopher Stagg, yes, hundred thousand songs of Minerva. Okay. Any more questions? Okay. Okay, we'll conclude then. Last question. Could you please correlate the turnings of the wheel with the Four Noble Truths again. Yeah, the Four Noble Truths, they belong to what we call the first turning of the wheel. Yeah, first turning of the wheel. The teachings on emptiness, shunyata, the paramita vehicle, the second turning of the wheel, and then Buddha nature, and implicitly also the Vajrayana teachings have a lot to do with the, um, the third turning of the wheel. Actually, it's not true. The Vajrayana teaching is based on both the second and third turning of the wheel. Yeah. So third turning of the wheel really is teaching on Buddha nature. Yeah. So four noble truths, first turning of the wheel. Okay. May Bodhicitta, precious and sublime, arise where it has not yet come to be. And where it has arisen, may it never fail, but grow and flourish ever more and more. Through all our births, wherever we may be born, may we be endowed with the seven good qualities of the higher realms. As soon as we are born, may we meet with the Dharma and have the freedom to practice it properly. At that time, may we please the holy gurus and practice the Dharma throughout the day and night. Realizing the Dharma and accomplishing its essential meaning, may we cross the ocean of existence in that life. Thoroughly teaching the holy Dharma in this world, may we never tire of accomplishing the benefit of others. By this vast benefit of others, without partiality or bias, may all attain Buddhahood together. Okay, okay there's a last little <laughs> there's a last little question here. Negative, negative emotions get a very bad rap in the second turning teachings, but ultimately there are neither good nor bad emotions, aren't there? Well, actually negative emotions get a bad rap right from the start. And even though we understand 
that you can say this is the display of the mind the problem is when this is filtered inevitably filtered through the confusion of ego then then necessarily they become the causes of suffering so that's where they get a bad rap and we are seeing them all as arisings from our buddha nature in the third turning of the wheel so we need to see the teachings on emotions in light of which turnings they fall under don't we that's right that is true so we would well they all you could say they all pretty much arrive at a, the same place but yes there's there's much more confidence in the third turning of the wheel and also in the second turning of the wheel with regards to understanding essentially the interdependent nature of emotions so that both the subject and the object that are what you could say generate the emotions um this this duality in the, the, the degree to which we understand the absence of that duality then also we're freed from this you could say filter or this confused projection of ego so to that extent then the arisings of the mind then are freed so yes there's increasingly profound ways of working with the, the arisings of the clashes or the, the negative emotions okay all right see you soon bye bye